Good morning and welcome to the meeting of the Employment and Income Maintenance Subcommittee of the California Power Professional Program Working Group. I'm gonna just check. Thank you so much, Linda. I appreciate you starting sure. the meeting. And um, after you've had a chance to check what you need to check, can we please take roll? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes. I don't see uh, Carolyn in the attendees, so I'll go ahead and take roll. Um, Fleischman? Here. Uh, Shining, I don't see Carolyn. Um, Spyro? Ira? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> you're still <laughs> muted. No. Can't Linda, wait. Carolyn's in attendees. Uh, oh, oh, God, I see her. Thank you. She, she just got there, though. We didn't miss her before because I've been right. monitoring that. Okay. Thanks okay. For raising it. I was going to do that when it was my turn. Okay. And Ira, right. Will you raise your hand? Did you want to say something, Ira? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, <laughs> great. And um, uh, uh, Shining? She's raised her hand, but not unmuted. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, is my microphone working now? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, okay. I'm here. And, and judge and judge you. I'm here. I thought you were blowing us a kiss. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> okay. So um welcome everyone. And um once again, I just want to appreciate staff. Um, I think Leah was working a lot this weekend. Um and for all the meetings we have to go to, and it feels like a lot of meetings. I'm sure staff is going to three or four fold more meetings than we are going to, or possibly five fold. And so, and Leah emailed me last night after 11, you know, with updates and then early this morning at 7.30. So I just really appreciate all the work that staff is doing to try to get us what we need to make decisions. And hopefully we'll be able to make some decisions today. Um, I see Carolyn's hand is up and I wanted oh. to check with her before we oh. go to public comment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so for those of you in the attendees room, and there are eight of you, if any of you would like to make public comment at this time, please feel free to do so. Just so you know, this is the subcommittee on employment. Um, I know that we received quite a number of comments regarding whether or not paraprofessionals should appear in the courtroom. And while we're happy to hear from you on those, that issue is not going to really be addressed today. And I see Ms. Harrison has her hand up. And so does Ms. McVeigh. And okay. also um, quite a few hands now. So okay. um, shall we, um, since we only have two hours and we do want to try to make some decisions today, if we can, um, may I say that since there's about five hands up that each person gets two minutes and if we need to, we can give them an extra minute, but we'll shoot for two minutes each. Okay. okay. So you can go ahead, Ms. Harrison, just raise, uh, unmute yourself. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Jeannie Harrison from Los Angeles, president of CALA. My understanding is that the consideration for today and the vote for today is about whether paraprofessionals should be allowed to represent plaintiffs in uh, limited civil and maybe also unlimited civil cases in, in wage and hour cases in court. Um, and wait, I wanna say that wage and hour cases, even small value ones are rarely just wage and hour cases. They overlap with the other types of employment cases that the group has already excluded. For example, today, my office is filing a lawsuit against an employer that prolifically sexually harassed my client named Chrissy. In addition, that employer violated many wage and hour laws and we're including those in her complaint. Those violations standing alone would qualify this case only as a limited jurisdiction case, but it's not a limited jurisdiction case because of the sexual harassment related claims. If Chrissy, who is a low, low wage immigrant worker went to a paraprofessional instead of us, she, she could have been convinced just to pursue her wage and hour claims and file in limited civil, which would have been a massive disservice to her and her fellow workers by creating a limited civil juris jurisdiction wage and hour business avenue for paraprofessionals, you're incentivizing them to steer employees like Chrissy only into filing those claims. Or even if she does hire a paraprofessional for her wage and hour claims, what happens to the sexual harassment claims? Her case- 30 seconds. Thank you. 
a paraprofessional represents her in her limited civil case on her wage and hour claims only. And then what? I file a separate sexual har harassment lawsuit. So this, this working group uh, subcommittee wants to increase the number of lawsuits filed in Superior Court because that's the way this plays out. And the cases are going to be related anyway and consolidated to the sexual harassment judge. They're rarely simple wage and hour, non fiha non paga, paga, non class action types of cases because employers usually engage in multiple Here, the time is up. violations. Instead, as originally planned, paraprofessionals should represent employees in administrative hearings before the labor commissioner. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ms. Harrison. Sorry, we had to cut you off but we appreciate your comments. Um, would you like to call the next person, Linda? Kelly McVeigh. Hi, Ms. McVeigh. Hi, um, I'm just here with Beth Zedek to listen in today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so sorry, I thought your hand was up. If you wanna say anything, Ms. McVeigh, please oh. raise your hand again or you, you're uh, able to. No, that's all. We're just here to learn and listen today. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Leonard Sansanovich. With the cute dog. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Sansanovich. That is me. Good morning. Yes. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Uh, a, a dog photo, not a dog filter. Yes. <laughs> Just building on what Ms. Harrison said. I'm um, sorry, I'm getting an echo. <clears throat> um, there are a number of uh, It's distracting, I apologize. A, a number of uh, defendants are foreign corporations or limited liability companies uh, that have managing members that are from out of state. So those claims or those cases likely would be removed to federal court under diversity jurisdiction. And if the paraprofessionals are not recognized by the federal court system, what happens to those cases? Um, also, if the claims are filed in superior court, I don't have the data on this, but I do recall reading something, and I know anecdotally, that well over 90% of uh, employment cases resolve by settlement. If there's a settlement, then that means that the employer will be seeking a release of all claims, both known and unknown. So like Ms. Harrison's case, where there were wage and hour claims, as well as sexual harassment claims, or if there are, uh, if there's a whistleblower retaliation claim, or a wrongful termination claim, those claims could be worth much, much more than limited jurisdiction uh, wage and hour claims. Uh, yet the employee would have to seconds or know those. In the DLSE, the commissioner or issues an order, decision, or award in ODA. If that's not paid, then the DLSE uh, requests entry of judgment in superior court. But it's it, it's a judgment that can be enforced and the employee does not have to give up any subsequent rights. So uh, there are other reasons, um, but for those reasons, since I'm limited in time, I would, I would discourage the use of paraprofessionals in limited jurisdiction cases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Ostertag. You're, if you unmute yourself, you can begin speaking. Hi, this is Jennifer Ostertag. I'm an attorney uh, in Los Angeles and I've been practicing for over 21 years. I'm a board member of CALA. I'm the chair of the Beverly Hills Bar Employment Law Section. I'm a member of CELA. Uh, throughout, uh, even though I'm based in Los Angeles, I've represented plaintiffs throughout California, even as uh, north as Nevada City, uh, which I'm sure most of you have never been to. <laughs> um, when a potential client calls, it's never a simple case. I have uh, clients, for example, I remember the um, very nice man would call me a few years ago about potential personal injury case, but however, when I just talked to him, I realized that he had been employed for 20 years illegally as a gate guard and had been paid like 
like three to four fifty an hour during his employment. So the issue is that that case was had rest breaks, wage an hour, wrongful termination, had some uh, injuries. So it was a very complicated case. And on top of it, when I as I was interviewing the person, I realized that he was not the only employee who had been um, abused by his employer who was bringing people from Mexico and paying them, uh, you know, three to four dollars an hour. So I think the problem is when you have a paraprofessional who is going to be limited in their representation and may not understand all the complex issue and how a case that we may be potentially start a personal injury may reach over to employment and also become a representative action. So I think that the group got it right over the summer that the paraprofessional should be limited to labor, uh, labor commissioner representation and not in superior court. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alan Romero. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm here to speak in opposition to the proposal. Uh, I'm a trial attorney. Uh, I'm a young a minority trial attorney. And before that, I was a social worker. So I've worked with disadvantaged populations. I'd like to say basically, law I see as a science and an art. I think secondarily, it's a business. I think treating it like selling widgets, it's not in the best interest of the public because I see different firms uh, who advertise heavily on Facebook and in the media, they settle $10,000, $50,000 case for $300 all day. I see it nonstop. They don't care about the clients. They don't care about the outcome. And essentially they care about nothing but their profit margin. They, they calculate their, their cost per acquisition per lead. And if they make a couple hundred bucks and the client loses 10,000 bucks, they don't care. They still made a profit. I think uh, you know, there's a breadth of knowledge that's required to litigate these type of cases. And I have some textbooks here, but I guess you can't see them. So I'll describe them to you. They're about four inches thick each. There's two of them. And that's what I use to educate my attorneys. I send them to a seminar when they first start now, para paralegals may not uh, know everything in the textbooks, that's fine, but the de defense attorneys will, and they will throw the book at these paraprofessionals if they're not prepared. I see it all the time. Um, I think also there's, there's been accusations. I understand that you know, my position, the position that myself, Ms. Harrison, Ms. Ostertag, and Mr. Sinsanowitz are advocating is elitist. To that extent, I disagree. If you look at the daily appellate decisions, which I do, there's three areas of law which are largely the most uh, the most published decisions, the most rapidly changing areas of law. 30 There's, seconds remaining. One is environmental law, which is land use. The second is criminal, because obviously in criminal cases, everyone appeals. And finally, it's employment. It's a very nuanced, very complex topography. And I, it, it's hard for, even for me to stay on top of it. I learn new things every day. And that's what I love about my job. So is it elitist to say that you know a, a lay person can't figure this out? Uh, perhaps, perhaps not, I don't think so but I think it's the objective truth. You look at the number of appellate decisions coming down on a regular basis. This is not immigration. That's time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, looks like another hand went up. Yes, Chris, Chris Dolan. Hello, thank you for holding the hearing today. The part that I wanna emphasize is the importance that these cases make not only in an individual's life, for example, I hear folks talking about representing a, a person who's suffered some sort of transgression at work. I do cases that affect policy on a, on a level that's statewide and nationwide. And for example, the Private Attorney General Act, PAGA, it's a, a very arcane um, law that you have to follow a number of steps, but the impact that it can have on society is huge. So I think when we look at the, the, the effect of using paraprofessionals, we have to look beyond, can they assist someone on an individual level and how will that particular involvement affect the law in the years to come? Will they build an adequate appellate record so that a, an error by a court can be overturned? Will they have the ability to know what's appealable? Will they have the ability to follow PAGA? Will they make the institutional change that can be made uh, at, as a lawyer with knowledge of the facts and the law? Or are we going to be basically bringing this down to an issue of just retail um, assistance, which is fine, but we have to understand that, that that retail assistance model is going to impact the larger body of the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. Good to hear from you. Nice to see you, Jonner. Thank you so much. Uh, I think there's another hand from Mr. Chen. 
Yes, uh, Vincent Chen. Oh. Good morning. I'm an employment attorney in Oakland, California. I represent um, both individual and class uh, plaintiffs in regards to wage and hour. And I think limiting the paraprofessional scope to the labor commissioner would be great because oftentimes a lot of these clients that come in, um, especially uh, lower wage workers, often have claims outside of wage and hours, such as possible harassment, discrimination, retaliation. And when these you know, claims are litigated or uh, brought before defendants, oftentimes they do want a global settlement. And by you know, having a global settlement for a wage and hour case, these you know, workers might be releasing claims that they're not aware of in regards to you know, either FIHA retaliation or you know, discrimination. And so I think that purely for uh, the purposes of paraprofessionals, it should be limited to uh, the labor commissioner here. Thanks so much, Mr. Chen. Um, and does anyone else wish to say anything among the attendees group who hasn't had a chance to say anything so far? Okay, so thank you for those who are hearing uh, here as attendees and thanks for your comments. Um, we'll now kind of look at the work that we have today. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to come to some decisions on wage and hour. And so Leah, would you like to share with us what you've prepared? Yes, um, so I shared with Judge Yu I, last night around 11 that um, the speakers I'd hope that we could hear today from someone uh, from wage justice on the enforcement of judgment question wage an hour and then p allow us to pivot to unemployment benefits I had an ALJ lined up for us but neither of those worked out uh, for today so um, what I what I did do is prepare a few slides that I hope capture the key kind of issues or points that have been identified um, with respect to uh, primarily the labor commission process. And then I've also tried to capture some of the issues associated with the enforcement of judgment um, proceedings in the superior court side. And really, I think as Judge Yu has uh, teed up, the, the hope is that we will, or you all will be able to come to some decisions today on the wage and hour piece. So let me advance the slides, just put it up here. Um, so I think I'll just give people a chance to look at this. Can I, I, I you know, Leah, I gotta object right here and now. I've asked for these slides over and over and over again, and some of them are simple, and this is crazy. The slide that you just put up for the Labor Commission and Judgment Enforcement is 50, 500 words long. I've asked for the resolutions in advance. I, I, I don't know what to say. I am not an employment specialist. I'm a, I, I do plaintiff's work. I've done some. Um, I know there's other people who say here that there's some rather than other. Uh, I, I just look at this and think, why couldn't this be given to me in advance? Carolyn, um, first I ask you to check your tone. I think that we all wish that lawyers would be as professional and courteous as possible. And I don't appreciate your tone. Second, Leah said she was working on this on the weekend. And I'm not sure when she found out that the speakers had to pull out. And after that is when she prepared this and sent it to me after 11 o'clock at night. I actually did think, should we send this to Carolyn? Because I understand she's going to be perturbed. But I felt like it wasn't really appropriate to send you something at 11 o'clock at night particularly because what is here is actually what we've already talked about and covered. I understand that what Leah has done is basically summarize. I understand maybe because I'm in a trial court so we get things last minute a lot and um, it's not because people couldn't, they couldn't get it earlier, it's just when they do. And also I'm in drug court so that's things change moment to moment. I understand when we need more time and there's a courteous way to say, look, can I please have some time on this? or maybe we won't be able to make decisions today, but I don't think it's appropriate to present things in a tone, particularly in a public meeting that is disrespectful of people. There's, as we know, there's not a lot of staff on this right now. And as I said, for every meeting we're going to, which to me seems like a lot, 
um, I'm sure staff is going to three, four, five fold more. So I would respectfully, Carolyn, ask you to please check your tone. Now getting to your concern, what can we do to make this better so that you feel that this is more helpful? Would you like an email to you so you can hold on to it too? Do you wish to maybe table something so that you can have time to look at this? Maybe we won't be able to make decisions today. Um, let's get to what your concern is. What, what would make it better for you? I apologize, Your Honor. Um, I did not intend any tone that was disrespectful. Thank you. Um, this is a lot to look at. It is. And if it's all we have to do today to talk about it, then let's talk about it. Um, yep. But um, it's, it's a shame that we didn't have the experts here today. Uh, we do have some of the state's best trial lawyers in employment who are listening. And um, I would, you know, we have some of the absolute, absolutely top, top experts uh, on, the, uh, on the line here who gave comments. If it's possible, I would like to give them, since we don't have any other people, perhaps one or two or three of them, uh, if they're still on the line, could give us some insight on this if they can see it. Um, yeah. They are still on the line and that's a good idea. We can go back to public comment after people have had a chance to digest this. We can leave it on the screen or perhaps I could ask staff to just email it to the members who are here in this call so we can actually be, have it in hand. Sometimes it's easier to look at it because there's one more slide to look at. And so that if we had it in hand, we could look at it back and forth. And I, I don't have it in hand either. So although I did have it last night, I was at home, so I, I didn't print it out. Um, are there any other reactions from, from our committee members or staff who are on the, on the line here? about what we're seeing and is there anything that we could provide that would make it a little easier to digest this information? Would anybody like to be heard? Steve, anything? Ira? No, I, I'm, I can read this right now, and uh, although I've worked in the area, so maybe it's easier. I'm with Carolyn, I've never worked in this area. I've only had some trials, so I, I understand why um, it takes a little while to just have it go into the brain. Um, and Steve, did you want to say anything? I'm hoping we can come to a decision on wage and hour in Superior Court today. Insofar as this slide appears to be directed towards wage and hour issues outside of Superior Court, except for enforcement of judgment, if Carolyn wants to defer this to our next meeting, I'm fine but I'm really hoping we can decide once and for all wage and hour superior court litigation today. I, I agree because this has been sort of on our plate for a while and be nice to move it off and get to some other issues. But, you know, if people feel like they need more time, I respect that. Um, Judge, you, one of the things I, I was gonna say, this is it for today and there is just one more slide. Um, we could also, I can send this out now. We could take like a 10 minute break from our Zoom. People could look at it. It is intended to not present any new information. Simply I listened to the webinar from our last meeting and tried to put down some key points that were raised. Um, but we could take like a recess to have folks take a look at it and come back. That's one option. Uh, that sounds like a good option. Would that work for you, Carolyn? Well, why don't we go ahead and see the next slide? So okay. Okay. Here, look, I'm trying to email this also. So hold, hold on okay. a second. All right, I've emailed it. Since we do have time, I think a recess would be helpful. And the PowerPoint just came through to everyone. I'm thinking 15 minutes. So come back at 1145. And then that would give, do the attendees see this too? Oh, they can see the PowerPoint on the screen, right, Leah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if the attendees want to during this time also look at it, um, or if- Okay, I'll switch to slide two if we're gonna, take um 11 45 is 19 minutes that might be a little long oh, but i could sorry. 
I could, I could, if, if you want to do like 10 or 15 minutes, I can switch halfway through to the second slide for those that are just viewing it. I want to just make sure Carolyn feels that she's had time because I, I, I still appreciate not wanting to be rushed. Um, and especially if we're going to vote today, um, you know, I think people need time to just digest it. So I, Carolyn, is 1145 going to work for you or maybe 1140? What is better? 1140 is fine. I just, okay. um, do we have the resolution that's going to be proposed too? No. Would you like to start? Why don't we, we could start working on the wording, but I don't think we have a resolution because I don't think staff knew where we were. Um, and I was going to take, suggest taking a straw poll, but I know you don't like them. I perceive we're not going to have unanimity. And I'm thinking we might even have a split vote. Um, I'm not really sure based on our past, you know, interactions. But if you don't mind, I could do a straw poll right now. So staff during the break could maybe think about what a resolution might look like. I'm willing to do whatever your honor says. I, I think if it was, we're going to have time to talk about this today. And we do have another meeting. But yeah. I, I, I'm hoping we can get to some things today. Anyway, a break would be great, your honor. But you can, if you want to just say something now for a vote, I'm fine with that. Well, let, me, let me just poll a poll. Uh, yeah, I think I heard the, the speakers whom you say are experts in the field say that they had no problems with wage and hour being heard in an administrative hearing before the Labor Commission. Um, I think that's, you know, acceptable too. I think Steve thinks that is. Steve, do you think that or do you think it's not? Yes, and I think we have already approved that because we previously said it might have been in general civil, but we previously said we will approve paraprofessionals to advocate in administrative proceedings where the law already allows non-lawyers to do so. So I think we've already covered that. Do you, <coughs> you chair general civil, Carolyn, do you agree with that? I think so, but I, I have tried to dig back and find the resolutions because I want to see the resolutions so that we're not going overly broad from what we already discussed. I think the conversations have been very broad and sweeping. So whatever we decided, we decided, and I don't know why we have to revisit that. That, that, that was in um, income maintenance. It was administrative agency proceedings relate under the income maintenance um, category. So all of those, that was the overlap, right? With employment, because we have wage and hour, which is an admin agency proceeding unemployment. But then there are also all of the public benefits, non-federal, like most of them administered by the social services agency. So it, it actually is part of this particular subcommittee, employment slash income maintenance. We haven't gone to the income maintenance pieces yet. And when we looked back, um, at the resolutions, it, it was included. So it, that may be a conversation for the end of this meeting to see if you all feel like anything more needs to be done on administrative agency income maintenance proceedings other than unemployment and wage and hour, if you feel the issue's already been settled based on what happened previously at the working group. Um, but that is under the purview of this subcommittee. Okay. Erica, what yeah. I do think a straw poll would be helpful at this point is wage and hour litigation in superior court. Yes. I think if we take a straw poll and see where we're at, that may inform where we need to spend time and where we may not need to spend time. I agree. I'll get there, Steve. I just wanted to babe, I was hoping to get the law the low hanging fruit out of the way. Okay. <laughs> which is why I was hoping we could get to the just, you know, this is that if it's in front of the Labor Commission, I think we have some consensus. But Ira, are, what do you, what's your position if it's an administrative hearing? Uh, my, oh yes, paraprofessionals should be uh, allowed to represent uh, uh, plaintiffs in the uh, Labor Commission or administrative Okay, hearing. thanks Ira. Um, and so now let's get to what Steve posited, which is, um, what is in the straw poll, what's our view on having paraprofessionals handle um, wage and hour in court? And I think what we were thinking is that it would be in limited jurisdiction. And I think that would include judgment enforcement or be judgment enforcement. Leah, do you want to add to the, what we're thinking of in terms of the straw poll? 
No, I just, um, I think I'm a little confused to, to be honest, because we've only talked about the superior court representation with respect to enforcement of the wage and hour judgment, yeah. not bringing sort of an affirmative first instance wage and hour suit in the superior court versus DLSC. I so, um, and I, I feel like the things have gotten kind of mixed in our conversations. And I don't know if that if that's intentional or if we do want to be sort of narrowly focused on enforcement of, of DLSC wage and hour judgments. Um, so that, I, I don't I didn't I don't have anything to add to clarify, but I think I'm a little mixed up on that. Okay, I'm I'm thinking it's also enforcement of judgment. And Ira, you have your hand up. Yeah, you know, I suggest that for the straw poll, maybe for everything. Um, we uh, separate out enforcement of judgments and on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, uh, wage and hour claims up to $25,000. I'm, I'm certain at this point that nobody advocates it above $25,000. Okay, and Steve, before we do the straw poll, you have want something you wish to say? Just, I agree with what Ira and Leah said that in judgment enforcement should be dealt separately. That once you get a labor commissioner, we heard from Judge Buckley, that's a separate issue. Okay, so um, straw poll, not binding. We can change our mind. We can also say we need more information. How, um, what's your position on allowing paraprofessionals to go to limited jurisdiction civil to enforce a DLSE judgment. Um, Steve, yes or no? Yes, just enforcement of a judgment they obtained before the labor commissioner. No affirmative claims beyond that. Carolyn, what's your straw poll vote? It, it's very hard, Your Honor, to really flesh this out in terms of what we're gonna see in the resolution. And I've had that frustration before that we vote one thing in a straw poll, the resolution says another. However, as it's phrased, if you have the right protections, if we're, gonna, we're dealing with that in regulation, and I have big concerns about the licensing, the regulation, uh, people being um, certified in two areas, family law and employment, I have big, big, big problems. So in terms of a straw poll, as it sounds as a general concept, I think it's probably something I can support However, there are quite a few things the, the the proof is in the pudding on this one. And so, you know. It, it... I hear you. I hear you that you're saying you wanna see the resolution and you don't wanna be bound to anything. And I think what we're trying to do is get to a straw poll to help staff write the resolution. And then we can massage that today to make sure that we can have everyone be comfortable who votes for it. Okay. And I. And I... I have a message as Ms. Harrison can talk further about this if we you know, want to ask her questions or, or get sure. to some. Yeah, I don't see her hand up, but we can go back to public comment after the recess when people have a chance to look at everything. So thanks for letting us know. Ira, what's your straw poll vote? I, I vote yes on enforcement of judgments, but I, I don't see any reason to limit that to, 20, to limited jurisdiction. Many uh, uh, judgments from the... Um, Labor Commissioner are going to exceed that. I'm going to get there. I'm really trying to peel the onion layer by layer to help staff and help us clear, with clarity understand what we're doing. Because I'm worried that if we don't do it that way, we're not going to be able to move forward. So that can be the next Fine. next issue. And I also support it. So it looks like if the resolution is written in a way that's comfortable for everyone, we're going to have actually unanimity on that. So then the next thing is, um, what about wage and hour, in, or sorry, enforcement of a judgment that was obtained before the DLSE where it's over the $25,000 cap and it's in general jurisdiction? I, I can just say I'm not really supporting that because I heard Judge Mnookin say that so many of them are like so small and there's just other considerations about unlimited jurisdiction. So that's, I just see that because I um, feel like that will explain where I'm coming from and there's no you know, guesswork because I, I anticipate, I know what Steve and Carolyn are gonna say. Steve? Yeah, I agree. It should be, everything we do should be limited to limited jurisdiction. 
I just want to clarify when it comes time for writing resolutions, perhaps we should be thinking in terms of phrasing it as limited jurisdiction rather than $25,000 because there are always proposals to raise the limited jurisdiction cap. I, I leave that for your consideration, but yes, I agree with you, Erica. Unlimited should be out. And the reason why is because this is new, Ira. I'm, I'm not saying unlimited should be out forever, but just for this initial, you know, introduction of the program. Carolyn, um, what's your position? Yeah, absolutely not. Okay, you want limited, is that right? No, I do not want limited. That's the way you phrased it, Your Honor, with all due respect. Oh, I'm sorry. It again. So my, my point here, I understand the small, and maybe this is the third slide that Leah had in the third slide that things are undone and, and undecided. And I did not agree that that's why I need to see our resolution from July and August. But I think there is no way, shape or form. There are 12,000 cases pending in federal court for employment right now, 12,000. I think you want limited, right? You want limited? No, 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 no. What well, you need to phrase it, Your Honor. When you say, I want limited, um, I, I don't know what that means. I, until I, I say finish okay. those sentence. So maybe if I can, then maybe I'm saying that you do not want these judgments to be enforced by paraprofessionals in unlimited jurisdiction. You want it to be in a limited civil jurisdiction. Is that right or wrong? I, I, I thought or, that's what but, the last appeal was. But Your Honor, I just, uh, this is so complex. I don't understand why we're doing any of this at all. I would, uh, my vote here in the straw poll okay. is to have nothing over $25,000. Now, if we have more discussions and more, you know, things on that, but if you have a wage and hour claim that's more than $25,000, there's other things going on. I, okay, we're on the same page. I'm not sure if the I'm using a word that's foreign in terms of limited and unlimited, but I'm thinking limited is under 25,000. Unlimited is over. That's what I'm thinking. And spot uh, Ira, I know you want it to be unlimited. Is that right? Or enforcement of judgments. Yeah, I don't see a, a reason for it to be limited. Okay. And then Ira, you said, um, I mean, you wanted to add another layer to the onion and you said you wanted work, you wanted wage and hour cases to be in Superior Court unlimited. Do you mean affirmative lawsuits or did, were you talking about judgment enforcement? Judgment enforcement. Okay. So then I think we've gotten the various layers that we would look at to help staff think about how to um, write up a resolution for us during the break. Is there anything that anyone would like to say before we take a 10 minute recess? Yeah, um, I, thought, I thought we were gonna take a straw poll on wage an hour, substantive disputes apart from enforcement of judgments. We can, but I had heard Leah say that she thought we were just talking about enforcement of judgment today. I, I, I did, but Ira, I think, raised affirmative litigation. And I do think the group wants to vote on that. I, 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 asked him and I just asked him and he said, I know, no. I know but I think <laughs> Ira, um, I no, think you did right. expressly say that you wanted to consider a separate category of wage and hour affirmative litigation not just enforcement of judgment, right? And Steve, I think you explicitly want to exclude that. So I yes. do think we probably need to tackle that too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Steve wants to vote on it, but not. <laughs> I, 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 I had understood that Ira raised that, but then when I circled back, I thought maybe I misheard. Um, so the next layer of the onion for the straw poll is do we want general affirmative wage and hour litigation to go to superior court, whether it be limited or unlimited? And Steve has said no. I would say yes, right? Yes for limited, no for unlimited. Okay. And Carolyn's a no. Correct. And also just point out uh, Mr. Sansanowitz and Mr. Dolan also have questions as well as Ms. Harrison. So there's going to be additional comment on this, and I really would like to hear it. We'll come back to them after the recess. Um, Steve, you're laughing or smiling. Yeah, yeah, I'm on pins and needles waiting for you to vote on this one. <laughs> you know, I kind of feel like I need more information in that 
I know Carolyn and some of our speakers who are high level litigators, very skilled, are saying that there's all, it's very complex, there's class actions, things are, they, you know, it's gonna be too complex. And I also heard um, Mr. Chen say, or I think it was, maybe not Mr. Chen, it was um, the speaker before him who's not here anymore, who said that he was a person of color and he wasn't being elitist, but I am concerned that we're always assuming that the paraprofessionals are gonna be unethical, untrainable and incompetent. When the examples that are being pulled by the lawyers saying that, like the appellate decisions and stuff are all about lawyers being unethical, um, uh, maybe an incompetent. And so there are incompetent and trainable judges, just like there's you know, unethical, incompetent, um, untrainable lawyers. And I don't know why we have to assume that all paraprofessionals are going to be unskilled. So well, my sense is to answer your question, Steve, and I'll get right to you is I kind of need more information on that one on that issue. Steve, go ahead. Erica, what I would say is this is our eighth meeting in this subcommittee. When you combine the two conservatively, by the end of today, we would have met for 11 hours. And that is a low number because before Justice Petro joined, our meetings would go beyond the allocated time, sometimes by a great deal. Right. We have if heard could from just tons of people. And say what I wanted to know. I think the answer will be here today, but I wanted to, you raised your hand. So go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say. Tell you what I, I need to know. Okay. There is no data out there supporting the idea that we need more lawyers in order to represent a missing group of people who are not able to find lawyers who have wage and hour claims. And there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. There's no suggestion in the Judicial Council statistics that wage and hour is a hotbed of pro per parties. To the contrary, I think the evidence would be most of them, the vast majority of them are represented by counsel. So I'm not sure what data it is you're looking for. If I could just say, then yeah. I can get you off your pins and needles. Okay. So let me finish. Okay. Thank you. So what I wondered is, how true is it? What is the actual um, information about how many of these cases actually end up in complex litigation or class actions? And I understand that Leah had talked to Mr. Aubrey about that, but that question didn't come up when he was there. Um, and so I'm wondering if she can share what he said. So it may be um, my turn, Judge, you to um, be miscommunicating. What I talked to you, Judge, to um, not Judge Aubrey, Mr. Aubrey, about was whether or not errors on the Labor Commission side might preclude a, a worker from pursuing a remedy in the Superior Court, like the risk, the harm of error. And that's what he indicated to me is the harm of error is very low. There really isn't that sort of, we don't have to have that concern. Um, you know, if you mess up on the admin agency side, you aren't waiving any rights that you have on the Superior Court side. And that's a slightly different question than the one you're asking. And so, yeah. I, and I didn't ask that, so I'm sorry. That's okay, it was late. Um, and then I, I understand that Ruth silver Taub is saying, no, the error risk is high. I think on balance, given what you just said, Leah, that it's, since this is a beginning of a program, it's better to just be more limited and more um, circumspect in what we do. And so in terms of just general wage and hour, I'm going to say that should be saved for another day and that we shouldn't include that right now. I would just not vote yes for it then. So Ira had his hand up. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, there, it's just the the argument that Steve has made uh, many times. Where's the uh, where's the data, the evidence? Well, you know, that cuts both ways. Where is the data and the evidence that these uh, uh, paraprofessionals are not needed? We and and Steve says there's many. Uh, people that have come on and said that that uh, 
they aren't needed. Well, there's many people who've come on and said that they are needed for wage and hour cases, including at least a half a dozen of them in our meeting of March the 9th. And I've got uh, uh, pretty much verbatim notes of what some of these people said, and I'll read them later. Okay, and we're just in straw polling. So, so this is not, you know, we're not voting yet. Carolyn has her hand up, then Steve, then I wanna go to Justice Petru and staff and see if they wish to say anything before we take our break. Carolyn? Okay, a um, couple of things. Um, the, um, the data is, Your Honor, that these things are in federal court. And um, I, Leah sent to me some statistics of talking about consumer debt, but I looked inside, I looked into them and again, there were 12,000 cases pending in federal court under the um, category employment across the country. So, but, Carolyn, just to be clear, when you say these things are in federal court, what kind of employment cases are well, you mean? It, it bears, it begs the question. And that's why, you know, I want to see the resolutions. So, you know, no, no, I'm trying to understand what you're saying, because I certainly have been, don't, don't, hold on a second. I've yeah. been involved with labor and employment actions, both in federal court as an attorney and in state court as a judge. And so when you say these things are in federal court, I'm certainly aware of a lot of federal labor and employment cases, but I'm wondering if you're focused on a particular area, if you're talking about wage and hour in particular or something else. The um, statistics that Leah forwarded me did not break it down into, um, this, it's, it's federal court, the employment category on the front. It also had civil rights and there were some employment cases that overlap with civil rights cases. Sure. So, so that was, I think, a very tangible piece of data. The other thing is I've read through a lot of the materials. I've actually read through everything that the ATILS people looked at. I did a FOIA request, and so I got like 4,000 pages and, and probably 300 articles. And there was some from UCLA, the, um, the Labor Center, and Ira might know more about that than I do. But there were, there were two papers that I thought were really interesting that talked about what workers need in these areas. Their recommendations did not include additional um, paraprofessional groups. Um, their uh, recommendations that I can forward those studies to you. Um, then and Ira may they may have come from Ira. I don't know, um, but um, but they did not recommend. They recommended more funding uh, for legal services in these areas. So there is data in the materials that we have, and we can pull it out if we have to. Okay. Um, so I would like to hear from people who haven't had a chance to say anything yet, if they wish to say anything. So um, let's. Let's hold Ira's hand and Steve's hand and go to Greg and see if he wants to add anything or say anything. Thanks, Judge. You, I, I actually don't have anything to say. I don't think I have anything to contribute right now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure Brady does. Oh. Uh, nor do I, Your Honor. Not, not, not at this time. And Linda's saying no. Um, and Leah, do you want to add anything or say anything? No. Okay, and Justice Petru, did you want to add or say anything? No, let's hear from uh, Steve and Ira first, okay. and then I'll see if I want to say anything. Ira and Steve, Ira? Your hand was up, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the, the federal court, uh, uh, federal courts are, are a non-issue in uh, whether so, uh, paraprofessionals should be allowed to have uh, to represent people in superior court in limited jurisdiction cases because those cases can't get into the federal court by removal. There's a dollar limit on, uh, on removed cases and on original jurisdiction that's way above the uh, uh, $25,000. So. Okay, Steve? I had a question for Justice Petro. Sure. Your Honor, the, the first district is kind of unique in that you're drawing cases from big cities and you have some smaller counties up the coast. Yeah. I'm wondering what you're seeing in terms of wage and hour cases in terms of self-represented parties. I actually look at all civil cases and I pay attention to who the parties are. And my anecdotal, but I've looked at hundreds or thousands of them, is that the pro pers on appeals anyway, tend to be clustered in things like family law, harassment, sort of neighbor disputes. I can't recall a wage and hour dispute seeing a pro per. I don't know off the top. I mean, I certainly can't give you data um, 
I feel like I saw one, but I can't swear to it. So um, certainly I think you're correct that you see more self-represented litigants, let's say in family, which is where I tend to see them the most. But I think that's more the nature of the case, quite honestly. I think that uh, with wage and hour cases, and I did have some, I'm trying to remember how much I had in, in limited uh, jurisdiction cases, because I had a few years when I had a, a civil direct calendar assignment that included some number of limited jurisdiction cases. I think there was the occasional self-represented person there, but it, 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 to me, it's a little apples and oranges, because when you're talking about a family law dispute, where you're talking about people's children and their property and their ongoing income, people are not gonna let that go after the um, trial court level. The right. um, need and motivation to bring that up on appeal is um, extremely high. A limited jurisdiction, wage an hour matter, self-represented, I, I just think the odds are much lower that that person right. is then going to be filing an appeal. But let me go about it the other way of your non where you have lawyers involved my understanding from judicial counsel statistics is that in fact a significant number of appeals get filed where the parties are represented by counsel and that wage an hour is a not so insignificant part of your civil docket it's in other words lots of people find attorneys for wage an hour cases and they wind up in your court so a lot of the wage and hour cases that we get, and again, I can't, I'm only going to be able to speak from my, off the top of my head, you know, it's not like it's data that I can just pull up real time. Um, you're correct. I have a lot of attorneys in wage and hour cases. A lot of those um, are group representative cases, like a class action case or something that, you know, would involve also a PAGA claim potentially. Um, it comes up a lot in the context of arbitration and whether some of these claims um, are required to go to arbitration or not. That's a repeat issue that, that's going to be coming up time and again. Um, but yeah, those, you know, what's hard for me to put my finger on the pulse of is the one-off individual limited jurisdiction wage and hour case. I think that's mm -hmm. where it's actually quite difficult for anyone with a straight face to sit here and say that they know how easy or difficult it is for that person to go out and get representation. Um, because I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think anyone on this call is specializing in the $5,000 wage an hour case um, or would you know be representing people in those kinds of cases. And so I no, certainly- but we, but we did hear- Steve, oh. wait. So I certainly, and thank you, Erica, but I'm, I'm, I'm fine with cutting people off myself. Um, so Steve, sorry to cut you off, but I do want to finish my thought, which is I do have the concern that there are people out there whose needs are not getting met because they don't have um, an attractive enough case for, you know, I mean, an attorney needs to be able to make a living. Uh, and there is a question here with even though sure um, fees are recoverable up to a certain amount in these kinds of cases, it's going to be limited. I mean, we are talking about cases that don't have a big dollar payoff and where you're not aggregating a number of claims together in order to then make it a much more. And when I say lucrative, I don't use that word in a negative way. Uh, you know, like I said, people need to make a living. So I have a concern about people with smaller claims not being able to have representation. How real of a problem that is, I don't know. I cannot say. Okay, um, I feel just for me when I chair something, it's really important for us to actually really listen. And so, and we have to let people finish. I read a great article about the importance of dissent. And so I agree we should, I think we all need to dissent and say you know, what we need to say. But nowadays, the article also said, people don't listen, they just reload. And then we wanna jump in and reload and reload and just argue our points. And we won't, well, the reason why we've had so many meetings in my opinion, Steve, is we're not listening to each other and we're just each trying to prove a point and get people to come and help us prove our point. So Steve, you're next, then Ira, then Carolyn. Steve? No, I'm, I'm done. Okay, Ira? I just wanted to remind uh, everybody of something. Um, uh, I think we're all unanimous, we are unanimous that uh, paraprofessionals should not be handling uh, PAGA claims. 
and should not be handling uh, class action or representative action cases. Okay, Carolyn? Well, I think we have some experts and we should listen to them. Um, you know, we have um, Mr. Sansanovich, Mr. Dolan, Ms. Harrison, they're the leading lawyers in this area. Carolyn, we will I, go back to them if we have time, but they're not experts on the issues that were raised by Justice Petrie. I think they are, Your Honor, and, and Justice, I, I really do think they are. And um, the PAGA issue keeps popping up and as if PAGA is, uh, if we say no PAGA, um, then that kind of clears the decks. But there's six, I think it's a six month window in which to file your PAGA claim after you get a DF, um, after you get the right to sue letter. I am not an expert in this. And, and again, Ms. Harrison, Mr. Dolan, they are. Um, but you have such a tight window. And if someone has a wage in our claim, they may not understand. Uh, they may be um, misled into the deadlines. And we talked in the regulation committee about the waivers in the, in the, um, uh, the conflict of interest waivers, the, um, the notifications that people would get. Um, the state bar, um, the, the recommended state bar um, uh, referral, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the word, <laughs> the fee agreement that we must have as attorneys that's recommended by the state bar is already eight pages long. And, um, you know, I don't know too many, you know, I try and keep mine a lot shorter if I can, but, you know, the recommended one for uh, contingency fees and, and hourly fees, eight pages long, and we're talking about adding to that. So I don't know how you can get a conflict of interest waiver with someone in these areas um, with giving them enough information and form consent to really grapple with that in our new paraprofessional area of law. So um, I think it's a really big consideration where these layers, these levels are gonna overlap, the subject matter um, combined with the licensure so, um, so it, it, I, I want to hear from our experts, Your Honor, but I, I think this, the concept that if we just say, oh, no, PAGA, they can't do class action, they can't do PAGA, it really understates the complexity of someone who is um, led to believe that they're getting everything handled. Um, I just, I really think we've got to think through that, and, and that's not something that we're ever going to be able to decide. I still would like to see the resolution that we voted on. Um, because I just don't think we should change that. Whatever I voted on, Your Honor, I'm not. Gonna, <laughs> I'm going to try and not go back on. Okay, Carolyn. Um, or I think we're at the point where I want to check in with you. Do you feel that you would like a break to look at those slides, or were you able to process them while we had our discussion, which was now, gosh, 40 minutes ago? Do you, do you would you still like a short break to look at those slides? We have, um, it's about noon, so we'll have until one o'clock. What do you think, Carolyn? Oh, to take a break right now and, and, uh, and think it through? You still need a break to look at the slides. Are we able to process them? Because it was about 1125 when we thought we would take a break and it's now noon. So I just want to make sure we're using our time well. If you don't need the break, we won't take one. But if people feel like we need the break, then we'll take a short break, maybe five minutes. What do you think? I, I'm trying to decide between taking a break and letting uh, additional public comment happen. I know these folks are super busy. Either or. You can we are going to have both. I'm just trying to figure out if we still need the break or not. OK. Um, folks are suggesting to me that page two needs to be put back up and then perhaps a comment period. So are you saying you don't need a break anymore? I do not. OK. Does anybody uh, feel like they would like a recess? Why don't we put page two up, please? Yeah. So I'm seeing some, nothing from Stephen Ira, uh, but I think that Carolyn was the one who felt the concern about the time. So no break? No, no, break. no Your Honor, but I, additional public. And I'm not sure if this is what's being referred to as page two. This is technically page two, uh, but this is page two of the substantive slide. So maybe the speaker will be able to clarify. This, may I go, uh, say something really quick, Your Honor? Yeah. Um, yeah, this page um, is where I think we actually did have consensus and maybe it wasn't discussed in, maybe this was discussed when I was not on the employment committee before we merged things. Carolyn, may I make a suggestion since clearly you are in contact with those people you asked to speak here today, 
could you just forward the um, slides to them? And then maybe they could look at them since you received it by email. And then your people could look at them and then we can have them comment and then we can get to a vote. That, that might save some time. And meanwhile, Judge you, I'm on another screen working on some draft resolutions. Thank you. But then, okay. Okay, so why don't we move to ask people who are attendees to raise their hand if they would like to comment. And um, we don't have that much time left and they many of them have already spoken. So I'm gonna ask them to each have 90 seconds or if we need to two minutes and to please only say something new something they haven't said um, about the slides or or something that occurred to them that that based on the conversation they've listened to um oh, uh, you, can i jump in for just one yes, second of course. um and this will make them take maybe you know two minutes rather than 90 seconds okay. Um, they folks have been held out as experts in employment law, and so it would be helpful for me to understand when they're speaking. Um, are they actually like what percentage of is this what they do? Is this what their practice area is? Um, because I think we have a lot of great people who are available to make comment, but I also know them to be experts in other areas, not necessarily employment. And so I would like to know, given um, Carolyn's representation that they're experts in employment law to have some understanding of what their work is in this field because that also helps us to understand their comments. Okay, that's a good suggestion and thank you. Uh, so two minutes per person and um, I see the hands are going up. So uh, Linda, would you please um, allow Mr. Dolan to speak? Yes. Thank you. You're, you can speak now, Mr. Dolan. Thank you very much. My background is I've done employment law as part of the work that I do for 27 years in my firm. Uh, one third of the work that uh, we do by the attorneys is devoted to employment. Uh, I've tried a number of employment law cases to verdict, including some of the largest in the United States. So that's my experience with employment law. I review employment law cases on a weekly basis of people who are seeking representation. I hope that provides an answer to your question. Uh, I think that one of the issues that we're dealing with, and you mentioned it yourself, were in your appeals, you're seeing issues regarding class actions and arbitration clauses. Those are coming from attorneys representing individuals. They're quite complex, as you know, and um, they're important matters. And if we're having paraprofessionals who are listening to these cases, who are listening to fact patterns, trying to figure out what applies, and charging by the hour, um, I don't think you're going to get the same analysis that you get from someone who's looking at it based upon a contingency because we're forced to look at it from the perspective is, is there going to be a success? But the other thing I think you'll have to go in and change a lot of the labor code to whether the um, paraprofessionals will be able to recover fees and costs on a, as a prevailing party. And there is a potential for paraprofessionals to charge by the hour for cases that those of us with 30 a level, seconds with a level of experience know from looking at them are not cases that should be brought. So I think that in saying somebody's not supposed to handle a PAGA claim, can't handle a PAGA claim, it's not that so much as would they even know what a PAGA claim looks like? Would they even know the remedies that are available? Would the free resources that are being provided and the resources of contingent fee lawyers that are provided without cost Will they be made available? Or is there a self-interest for a paraprofessional to represent? There's no self-interest in me to turn down a case that doesn't have merits, but there might be for somebody who can charge to try to um, work that case up or figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could just uh, judge you, if I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm gonna just jump in for one second. Sure. Uh, I, I think um, the issue of the issue of issue spotting, which is not the best turn of phrase, but the issue of issue spotting certainly strikes me as an important one. Um, the issue of you know turning down non-meritorious cases, I go back to what Judge Yu was saying that we have to have some consideration for people's ethics and ability to train and not um, treat them as um, somehow lesser than in regards to their ethical point of view. But I, I really do take to heart uh, what Mr. Dolan just said in regards to the ability to recognize issues. 
the thing, the reason I really wanted to say something was, um, Mr. Dolan also noted the fact that there would have to be some changes made to the labor code. That is certainly the case. And I just want to say for everyone on this call, and we will have this conversation further when we meet as an entire working group, we are well aware of that. And um, that writ large, not in regards to this particular question. And Leah has been working on, and we're working on what the protocol is going to be such that at the end of the day, when we have our recommendations in place, a fulsome review is done of what changes need to be made to the law, to the rules and regulations in order to actually implement. So uh, not to minimize that concern, but just to say that we are well aware of it and an overall review will be getting done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, to our next speaker then. Uh, good morning again, or good afternoon. <clears throat> There's my dog. <laughs> Uh, as to, uh, uh, sorry, getting the echo again. Um, Judge Hugh, you had asked, it, uh, how true is it these cases end up in class actions? Um, and Mr. Dolan brings up a good point. Um, if you're not looking for it, then, then you may not be talking to people about it. Um, these cases, I'm sorry, I should give you background. Uh, uh, Justice Petro asked for that. I've been doing wage and hour cases since 2008. I'm on the executive board of the California Employment Lawyers Association. Uh, I currently have about half of my cases are wage and hour. Uh, the others are other types of uh, employment cases, such as wrongful termination, whistleblower retaliation, dis, uh, discrimination, harassment, that kind of thing. Um, to find a class action representative uh, is not always the easiest. Um, the plaintiffs are not necessarily aware that what they are suffering is part of a pattern and practice of the employer, uh, that this is a widespread uh, policy or practice. So individually, if they just pursued their own 30 wage seconds claims, remaining. Uh, there's a great likelihood that they would not consider any kind of a class action, which would have a collective effect of changing the policy or practice for, for hundreds, if not thousands of workers. Um, I do have one concern that most uh, employment attorneys who I know of only work on a contingency fee basis. And if we're talking about low wage workers, even if they're shelling out only $100 an hour, that's still money coming out of their pocket up front um, that they wouldn't have to do with, uh, with an attorney. That said, I do recognize that most attorneys are not gonna be taking limited jurisdiction cases. Um, and as to Ira's point, uh, when I raised the issue of removal to federal court, I was assuming that those low wage, uh, excuse me, those low value cases would also have other components that would raise it above the $75,000 threshold. So thank you. Thank you. A couple more hands up. <clears throat> Jeannie Harrison. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. This is Jeannie Harrison. Um, I'm president of CALA in Los Angeles and have been litigating employment cases for 29 years, including trying them. Um, and as I mentioned, Justice Petru, uh, I, I do wanna frame this a little bit before you got on the line here. Um, I, in my public comment earlier, uh, pointed to a case I'm filing literally today on behalf of a low wage immigrant worker who has wage and hour violations um, that would have her land in, lim in a limited civil case. Um, however, she also was repeatedly sexually harassed and has related sexual harassment claims. As a result of that, her case clearly is inappropriate for limited civil. So I wanna put that in context of where do these cases land? Okay, <clears throat> so there are many of these individual plaintiff cases where there are just these standalone wage and hour violations if they do exist that just go to the labor commissioner. 
And that is clearly the best place and most appropriate place for mm -hmm. professionals to be representing um, employees is in front of the labor commissioner. When you have a single plaintiff case um, that gets filed in superior court, my experience has been that those cases, if they're combined with some other FIHA claims, as is this case that I'm- 30 seconds remaining. Thank you, will be filed by an attorney. Likewise, the other cases, if they're PAGA cases or class actions, they find attorneys. This is an extremely competitive area of the law for plaintiff's attorneys. In fact, it's so competitive for plaintiff's attorneys to be able to get good cases that there are things called reverse auctions as a result, where people will pick up a case, attorneys will pick up a case that is a class action and try to settle it out from underneath somebody who has a previously filed case. So it just simply isn't the fact, in my experience, that a very good, a meritorious case will lack representation, even if it's a low wage worker, immigrant type of case, they will find representation when it's appropriate um, by attorneys for filing in superior court. The other cases that are meritorious have lapsed. So I'm sorry, we need to get to work. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, Mr. Kuhn, thank you. Thank you. Erica, could I ask the speaker a question? Of course. Ms. Harrison, I'm Steve Fleischman at Corbett's and Levy. I'm a defense attorney. Um, arbitration's been discussed and PAGA's been discussed. My understanding is many claims are not sent into arbitration because of the existence of a PAGA claim because the California Supreme Court has held those claims are not subject to arbitration. It's been suggested that if we simply carve out PAGA and let a paralegal litigate non-PAGA actions, that would be a solution. It seems to me if we did that, then the worker would be losing a valuable tool in trying to avoid arbitration and would be worse off with a paraprofessional than with a attorney. Would you care to comment on that? Keeping in mind that um, you will have 30 seconds or maybe 60 to answer because we only have 45 minutes left. And Steve, you are the one that pointed out we should get to a vote. Okay. Ahead, Harrison. Thank you. Um, I, I think to your point, the, these cases are extreme. They are extremely complex. There is active litigation always to enforce the arbitration agreements. That is a very heavily litigated issue. And there is a tremendous amount of strategy obviously involved in that. Um, though those motions happen in virtually every case and uh, based on it's, it's very fact dependent and document dependent based on the arbitration agreement and judges make those decisions, right? So is that the best use of uh, or appropriate use for uh, paraprofessionals? I personally don't think so. I think there are a lot of uh, very extensive seminars that um, lawyers put on just to try to come up with and talk about the different strategies. So um, I, I think you're walking into a minefield for employees if you're going to allow paraprofessionals to represent them, even in limited jurisdiction cases. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Harrison. Uh, I thought I'm an expert in this too. Okay, um, but Ira, we're in public comment and uh, Mr. Kingsley has oh, his hand up. Well, so I let's hear from the last person and then we can come back to us. Right. Oh, thank you, Judge. Um, my name is Eric Kingsley. I've been doing wage and hour cases for about 20 years now. I actually last year recently had a published decision in Kim versus Reigns um, from the California Supreme Court. So this is an area I, I, I do on a regular basis. Probably about 80% of my practice is devoted to wage and hour. Um, one, one point I wanted to address as it related to the um, uh, federal court jurisdictional issues. Um, uh, many people were talking about a removal jurisdiction in terms of a mountain controversy, but you also could go to federal court if you brought um, wage and hour claims under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So even if you brought a claim for $500 under the Fair Labor Standards Act, obviously that claim could be removed to federal court as well. So you do have some multi-jurisdictional issues there as it relates to federal law in the wage and hour context. Um, and then my only other point I wanted to make um, is, is related to... Um, the types of cases brought. And, and I understand that there is a concern that, that smaller claims and limited may not be brought. I, I know personally that I have uh, at least two lawyers that I know that take cases under $25,000. Um, and then I would further state that we were talking about class and PAGA, that you know class and PAGA claims typically aren't necessarily large claims, are smaller claims, but 
plaintiff's lawyers take those and bring them as class and pocket claims if the defendant is obviously medium sized or large. So it's really just the subset of small employers and small claims that potentially would be problematic in terms of those claims being brought. And as I said, there are some lawyers that will take them if they're you know over 10,000, over 15,000. It's really the subset maybe below 30 seconds 10, remaining. Thank you. It's the subset below 10,000 that, 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 that it's a concern, but frankly, the labor commissioner is probably a, an appropriate venue for those claims. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've heard from all those who are in the attendees um, box. And so now we've got hands up among our panelists. I'm gonna ask you to please make comments that are new that you haven't said before, Ira and Steve. Uh, oh, Steve's hands down now, because we are fast losing time and we really want to get to a vote. Ira, anything new you want to add? Yes. Um, uh, You're saying I am? Things. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, first, uh, well, I'm going to say all the people who spoke here, they are experts. I know um, nearly all of them. Um, I've been doing wage and hour cases for 25 years. Uh, most of that class actions. The, the um, uh, first, the low wage, uh, Jeannie Harrison points out low wage cases, and, and, and uh, Eric just pointed out low wage cases usually get picked up by somebody who wants to do class action or, or a POGA representative action. But as Eric just pointed out, it's only when the employer is big enough. You can't do it. Anyway, you get that. It's only when it's a fairly large employer. Um, secondly, uh, it, something occurred to me here that uh, uh, it seems to me that one of the requirements uh, that we ought to have for um, paraprofessionals handling wage and hour cases, limited jurisdiction, is that they first uh, have to send the uh, client to a panel of lawyers or possibly to the CELA website because there could be a CELA lawyer who sees a class action there or a good PAGA action. If not, then uh, the paraprofessional should be free to take over. Thanks, Ira. Is there, was there anything else? Did I cut you off? No, okay. Okay, so I think that staff has, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you to Linda. I wish we could have you at all our judges meetings because it's really important to have somebody give somebody time checks. So thanks for doing that, Linda. And then I think staff has been working on potential language for resolutions. So let's take a look at that. Okay, thank you for doing that, Leah. Um, so our, is, let's take a look at them, take a moment to read them, and then let's see if we can get to some voting or massaging of the language. So Leah has captured all the uh, various suggested um, routes that we could go. Um, we've done some straw polling. Let's, um, Leah, did you want to add anything before we start taking them one by one? No. There, okay. Yeah. So the first one is paraprofessionals will be authorized to represent parties in Department of Labor. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Labor of... Department of Labor Standards Enforcement Labor Commission proceedings. Uh, do we feel comfortable with the wording, Carolyn? There's an error in the uh, title. Oh, okay, yeah. go ahead, Ira. It's a Division of Labor Standards Enforcement. Instead of department? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ira. Uh, any, uh, Ira, any other changes to the language of this first? first well, where it says DLSC, that would be DLSC. Below there. Oh, below. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so Carolyn, you. I think this is the thing that. I think this was what we already voted on. Is it not? Well, it may or may not be because you weren't sure. So let's just. Uh, is and what we voted on before was broader, which was that paraprofessionals could appear in areas where they're already appearing. This is more specific to the DLSE. Do you have anything you want to say about the language before you vote? You could vote no, but 
Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I think, yes, I think this is what we already agreed upon, but in the, in the context of listening to the other discipline licensing and uh, regulation, I, I wanna see this fleshed out. So I would vote yes to this concept, but it's really gonna be contingent and we maybe even put a little dissent in the in there, um, because you have to see how this is going to be uh, going to be um, going forward. Because again, I have a big problem if someone's allowed to be in three different areas, um, how they could possibly be trained on all these areas with the CLE twenty. It's, it's a lot of CLE, but I would just there's a lot of caveats I have with this. So I'm 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 not happy we're going revisiting stuff we already visited, but. A tentative yes okay um, right now i'm not asking you to vote carolyn i'm only asking if you want to massage the language of the resolution you can vote no but it's just the language do you have any no. changes to the resolution's wording no i think it's i think it's now it's very concise okay steve do, uh, do you have any issues with the resolution's wording first bullet point fine you're okay. only asking about the first one, correct? Yeah, we're only on the first one. We're peeling that onion one layer by layer so that we can make it simpler if possible. Okay, this, does Justice Petru or staff wish to be heard on the wording for only the first bullet point or first resolution? No. Anybody else? Okay, raise your hand if you do. See no hands. All right, are we ready to vote on the first bullet point, which is the first resolution? Is, is someone making a motion and seconding? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, there is another error in it. Okay, go ahead, Ira. It, it, labor commissioner, not commission. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. If we're ready to vote, then we are gonna ask for a motion. I'll make the motion that the first resolution be passed. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, do you wanna do a roll call vote or just say aye or nay? I think we, we have to do a roll call. Okay, great. Thank you. Fleischman? Yes. Shining? Yes, but I will be watching this in regulation and licensing. That's good. Spyro? Okay. Spyro? Yes. And Judge you? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we're going to the second resolution or bullet point. Um, it says paraprofessionals will be authorized to represent parties in the enforcement of DLSE wage and hour judgments in limited jurisdiction superior court proceedings. Ira, anything on the wording of the resolution before we vote? No. Sorry to put you on the spot and make you go first, Ira, but I felt like you did a fantastic job on the first one, so with all those changes. So Carolyn, do you have any changes in the wording for the second resolution, the second bullet point? No. Okay, Steve, any change in the wording for the second? Okay, are we ready to vote? And if so, is there a motion? I'll, mo I'll move it then. I move that we approve the second bullet point, the second resolution. Is there is there a second to that motion? I second. Okay, we'll vote. Fleischman? Abstain. Is shining? Um, uh, yes, with the same caveats I had about licensing and regulation. Spyro? Yes. And Judge you? Yes. Steve, okay. Motion carries. Steve, do you need a moment in terms of the abstention? Do you want to talk about that or should we just go on? No, I just don't want anyone coming back and saying I approved court representation when I did this, because that's not my intent. Okay, got it. So then the third one is paraprofessionals will be authorized to represent parties in the enforcement of DLSE wage and hour judgments in limited and unlimited jurisdiction superior court proceedings. Is there anything that we would like to change with respect to that wording? Ira, may I ask you to go first? I think this is really your motion and your thought. Uh, no. No, nothing change. Okay, uh, Carolyn, any change to the wording? Uh, no, I'm. I know how you're going to vote, but we're just talking about the wording. Steve, do you have any change to the wording? No. Okay, Ira, did you want to make this motion? Yeah, I move that we uh, adopt 
number three. And I'll second that. Okay. Uh, Fleischman? No. Shining? No. Spyro? Yes. And Judge Yu? No. Okay. That motion to, uh, fails. Thank you. So we'll go to the last one, which is private professionals will be authorized to represent parties in wage and hour proceedings in limited jurisdiction superior court proceedings. Ira, any changing to the wording? Yeah, I think so. Um, okay. to, in all fairness, I think the last word ought to be uh, claims rather than proceedings because it might contradict the other. Okay. Any other changes, Ira? No. Carolyn, any changes to the wording? No. Steve, any changes to the wording? No, but I just realized I have a problem with the first one. You mean the very, very first one? Yeah, I think it was intended, the intent all along was to represent workers, not employers. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, we'll go back to that in a moment. Let's okay. take care of this one. And um, Ira, would you, it's your motion. Would you like to make the motion? You move this? Oh yeah, I move number four. That we I'll, pass number four. I'll second it. Um, and so we can vote. Eichmann? No. Shining? No. Spyro? Yes. And Judge Yu? No. But again, my hope is as this um, program really gets its legs, and I, I believe it's going to be very well received, that we can start to look at, or somebody in the future will look at scope um, and whether or not the scope needs to be changed. OK. Well, I, I, you know, I, um, maybe interrupting, but I, I propose some, some variations of number four. I'd like to put them to vote. I can sure. state it pretty concisely. What, what is it that you'd like to say? Um, that it would, the number five, if you will, would be read exactly the same as it does now, but adding the following, uh, that's going to get cut. All right, good but uh, not in uh, PAGA claims, not in uh, class actions or representative actions, and only after uh, the uh, Let's see, only after advising the plaintiff uh, to uh, attempt to find a lawyer on the CELA website and uh, the client is unable to do so. I should have said client instead of plaintiff there. Above. Unable to find a lawyer <laughs> at the end. So you're making that motion right now, is that correct? I am. Yes. Is there a second? <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm sorry, it dies for a lack of a second. Um, Your Honor, if I could, one thing, and I'm just having uh, buyer's remorse a little bit okay. on number two because of what Mr. Fleischman said. I'm wondering if that would create a tie, uh, and and you might be able to vote then. Um, the um so i think i think carolyn you, you either need to decide yes or no on that one um and i think it's fine either way and then my understanding and leah can correct me if i'm wrong is that if there is a tie then i vote okay i i my my thought is and maybe this is a motion to amend um is that i think mr sam sandwich talked about under fifteen thousand dollars or or um the lower under ten thousand dollars so I'm just having second thoughts that we say just limited um, without restriction. That's kind of my problem with the regulation down the road. So I'm I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to propose like Ira did that we uh, really want to well, abstain, Your Honor. Certainly, if I could just jump in, I mean, you can certainly um, you know propose make another motion as Ira just did, but I think before doing that you need to decide how you're voting on this. I, and I then, think you know, vote however you want on this and then decide if you'd like to make another motion. 
I think, Karen, I'd like to change my vote to abstain on number two with caveats that I see real promise in that area, but I just really need to see it fleshed out. And um, whenever we talk about court, I'm going to talk about court a lot at our next meeting. So I think I want to abstain on that one. I apologize. Okay, and just to be clear with both you and Steve, you are choosing to abstain as opposed to simply voting no? Right. And correct. that's correct for you as well? Okay. Yes. Um, and so in that event, Leah, is it correct that I then have to vote? I don't know. Uh, I see Brady on here. So I'm going to turn to you, Brady. Do we need to re-vote now? We can't hear you, Brady. So wait, this is two switching from two eyes and three, two abstentions and two abstentions. It still seems to pass, but which is well, I mean, it's um, an abstentions really kind of count basically a no because you don't have then a majority to okay. to to pass. Then let's um, ask Justice Petrie. Well, before we do that, though, we, I need to understand procedurally whether that is correct. I know that in the full meetings, when there is a tie, then it is incumbent on me to vote. Um, and I'd like to understand whether that is correct for these subcommittee meetings as well. So there's uh, there are no um, written rules the state bar follows um, in, in these cases. It's, it's, it's um, essentially uh, uh, Tradition, we, we follow uh, Robert's rules generally. Um, in, in some bodies, if, if the chair's vote would, um, it sounds like in this one, the tradition has been, if the chair's vote would change the outcome, um, then they should vote. Um, that's not the case with all state bar bodies. Okay, the only reason I have any, um, not conf confusion for lack of a better word, is that I am not um, technically, I'm not on the subcommittee. Um, oh. So you're, you're the chair of the subcommittee, but not on the subcommittee. No, I am the chair of the entire committee, not the chair Correct. of the subcommittee. Um, the entire working group, I, I think, is the nomenclature. Gotcha. So, so, you, so you're only here um, as a, um, in that capacity. Ex officio. Correct. Yeah. That, I did not, that I did not understand. So you're, you're actually not a voting member of this subcommittee. So uh, That's why I was should, asking the question. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I, I didn't understand that. So now understanding that, what is your view? That you shouldn't vote because you're not a member of this subcommittee. So let me ask this, are there any committee members that are not currently present today? No. no. So it is only, it is for um, Steve? To, to get by this log jam, I'm willing to vote yes, if Carolyn, if that provides the deciding vote so we can move on to trying to fix number one and number two, the board parties. Okay, I appreciate that, Steve. <sighs> but we'll keep it. So uh, Brady, do we need to redo the vote though, right? I think we should because okay. we voted, um, yeah. did a roster vote. Okay. But I just want, I want to say, I mean, I, I met Steve through this context and he, I, I really experienced him just being very pragmatic and willing to just kind of work with people to move on. So appreciate Steve that you're willing to do that. Thank you. Should um, we entertain Steve's changes um, yeah. so that when we revote, you know, we don't, okay. I think that's a good idea. Thanks. So my, my motion would be to change in the first bullet point, change the word parties to individual workers is individual workers the term of art? I, I, I'm, I'm not wedded to it, but the idea is to represent the employee, not the employer. If you prefer the word employee, I'm fine with that. I think you could, uh, this is Greg, I, I think you could use the word claimant. Oh, good, yeah. Does that make sense, Steve, claimant? Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Greg. Did you want to add anything else, Greg? No, that's it. Okay. That, that, so um well, let's make the change in the second bullet point as well yep even though i don't think it actually practically has a difference in that one but in, in any event let's keep yeah, it consistent. true um i think what steve is adding really captures the dis discussion because we were i mean this is an enforcement action so um and we wanted to help people who don't have access to uh, lawyers. So I'm not sure what Ira's position is. So 
maybe if I could start with you, Ira, to see if you feel that these changes are acceptable and if you want to say anything about them. Uh, sure, they're, they're, that was a good idea by Steve. Okay, great. And um, thanks, Ira. And Carolyn, do you want to be heard on the changes? They're fine, they're fine. Okay, so does anyone feel like we need to re-vote on the first uh, resolution with the word change? Brady, do you think we need to revote? Yes. Okay. I think you should. I think you should. I mean, to be very clear, call each one, and I think it's important to be clear here, uh, and, and make make have the motion make clear that you're replacing the first vote on um, on, on the bullet point with okay with language. So I think that um, if we were really careful, we'd say that there was a motion to amend the first and second resolutions and then vote on whether or not there was an agreement on that, but we've already changed it. So let's just re-vote on the first and second resolutions. Uh, I make the motion on the first resolution. Second. Okay. Fleischman? Aye. Shining? Aye. Spiro? Yes. Judge you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I will make the motion on the second resolution. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Fleischman. Aye. Shining. I will abstain again. Uh, Spyro. Again, but okay. Yes. And judge you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we've got some res, oh, Steve, go ahead. Okay, now that we've clarified the claimant versus party issue, when resolutions three, four, and five go to the whole committee or working group, there's going to be a vote on them, as I understand it, and they will be adopted or rejected. Do we need Erica or Justice Petro or Brady, anyone speak up? Do we need to change, make the same change from parties to claimant in three, four, and five for down the road, even though these are no's? I would think yes, but what do you think, Justice Petru and Brady and Greg? Oh. Leah? Well, I question if they're going to go forward for a vote. So I know yeah. in the past, we have, you know, it's, I think in some of these um, memos, each member of a subcommittee has put forward a different position. There certainly hasn't been consensus. Um, but but I, maybe a bit of discussion around what you all want to bring forward to the full working group. I don't, I don't know that all five of these resolutions actually need to go for. I mean, the last one didn't even get a second. So I, so I, so I don't know, uh, Steve. Uh, otherwise, sure, I think we can make the changes in all of them. But stepping yeah. back, I don't think they all. Have I to do not want to make more work for the sake of making work. But if three, four, and five are going to the committee, I would prefer the word be claimant instead of parties. Can I, can I just jump in for one yes, second? Great. Thank you. So, so my view on, on motion three and four is this, that the, the group has decided that paraprofessionals cannot represent any parties in those scenarios that are outlined in three and four. I think that accurately captures the group's position. Um, you don't want them representing claimants or respondents in these types of proceedings. The thing that will probably be important if you do wanna bring these motions forward that the subcommittee considered them and decided against them if somebody in the full working group wants to make a motion to allow paraprofessionals to represent claimants, we just need to make sure that we use that wording when we're in the full group, if that makes sense. Yeah. Fine, fine by me. Very helpful. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, Steve, your hand's still up. Did you want to say anything else? Greg, were you... Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Brady. Greg, were you suggesting that we actually have a another bullet point summarizing the, the negative decision made or just that, and that that be a recommendation that we put forward to adopt or? Well, I, I think that staff can, can capture that. I think that the, the motions actually act accurately as worded now capture the position of the subcommittee. Right, right, okay. So I, I think we just need to, staff needs to just make sure that we, and I think because we've had such a fulsome conversation about this so far that we're probably going to remember this, this moment, but, um, 
but that we we point out this difference to the full working group because it may elude notice if we don't. Um, that this is what the vote was. This is what the vote meant. And if anyone wants to make a motion that we should decide whether or not they want to use the term parties or claim it with intention. Yeah, that could be expressly stated in the memo. So be mm -hmm. it can be stated in the memo, but for the recommendation section of the memo, I believe the recommendation, what we're asking the working group to vote on is these two that I've highlighted in right. the narrative, right? And the body of the memo can describe these other three. Yes. Okay. That's what I was thinking as well. All right. Okay. So Leah. Yes, um, if we have a moment, which it looks like we do, yeah. um, I just qu want to quickly pull up the resol um, where we are on the rest of the issues under the purview of this subcommittee, because it may be that people feel um, that we don't need to do anything else. <laughs> so let me, let me pull this up. I'm saying that somewhat facetiously. I'm sorry, this is taking me a minute. That's okay. So, this is the PowerPoint from when we first got together. And here's the, here are the resolutions um, from June. Um, paraprofessionals are authorized to provide full scope representation at the admin agency level where non-attorneys are authorized to represent parties in administrative proceedings by state law. Then we said the specific details of allowed activity will be discussed at a later date. For various reasons, wage and hour and unemployment were pulled out from the rest of income maintenance because of the crossover with employment and because employment really was a high focus, hot topic. But labor commission proceedings and EDD proceedings obviously fall under this income maintenance category. So when, when you all are talking about not wanting to revisit decisions that are already made, the rest of the agenda for this subcommittee, the rest of your tasks have to do with these administrative proceedings, EDD, and then the rest of them. And um, because this came up under the auspices of income maintenance, the administrative proceedings we're talking about are ben public benefits type. So we're not talking about school discipline hearings, for example, it was limited to all these public type of benefits. So my question for the group is, do you think we need to do anything more? Or are you comfortable saying, Yes, the paraprofessional can represent parties in EDD proceedings akin to what you just decided for labor commission. And yes, you know, basically, yes, we've already decided this. We don't need to spend more time digging into it. So I just wanted to pose that um, as we think about our next meeting on April 5th. What's the status of EDD? Uh, our decisions on EDD, meaning unemployment, uh... There, there's no stuff. So basically, even though EDD is a type of income maintenance administrative agency proceeding, it was carved out because of employment, you know, being such a focal area for many stakeholders, it was carved out. We never, no, there's no group that has dug into EDD. I'm just simply asking, do we still need to take that approach or are we comfortable now kind of circling back to what was decided in June of 2020 regarding all of these admin agency proceedings. Judge Yu, I see. Yeah. Oh, there's a hand. Hands okay. up. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn and then Steve. Deep breath. Um, so when we're talking about things being carved out, um, one of the problems that I'm having today is we're here to flesh out things. And again, we've revisited votes and now we have two different languages from what we decided in June and then discussed in five, six meetings in July and then had a full meeting in August. And so I'm very concerned that we are going to, in our next meeting in April, 
yet again bring up things that we've already discussed. So when we say we carve things out, a lot of stuff I feel bubbled back up and we've wasted, you know, what wasted, but we've spent now two more meetings. So I sort of want to understand when you say, do we have to go back and now add it in? What are these carve outs? What is the process? What, I don't want to see things like the appointment bubble back up because we put in a resolution that votes no and excludes it. And then someone in the massive meet in the big meeting says, oh, I'm going to pull that out. I'm going to move on that. So where do we get the process going? Um, I, I, I'm lost. I'm lost. We spent so much time, like Steve said, 11, 12 hours. I asked that this be put up at the start. And now we're asked to go back and fix it again on something else. We could have just been discussing that. I just don't. So, so Carolyn, I don't, um, I, I, I hope I'm remembering this accurately, but the reason in large part that wage an hour and unemployment were carved out is because of concerns you raised last year about the process and not want, wanting to provide, um, give extra attention to anything employment related. So that's how it got carved out. We, all I'm suggesting today is because I'm hearing repeatedly, like we don't wanna waste time. We've already made decisions to say, okay, is there more of a comfort level now to with this decision that was made back in June of last year, that, that would suggest that we don't need to spend a whole meeting talking about unemployment proceedings. And I don't need to bring in the ALJ from social services benefits hearings to explain that process to you, that maybe at this point, since we've gone through this rather extensive conversation about the labor commission process, maybe now everyone's comfortable. Yes, let's move ahead. Unemployment and the rest of public benefits, we're good. That's all I'm, I'm asking. So, uh, Carolyn, I understand you're feeling lost, and I do recall that we did take that out, and you were not in the beginning meetings, and so when you came in, there was some concern, and so we did carve out that. Um, I don't have a sense that we are going back over anything, um, but let's see what Steve would like to say, and then we can come back, Carolyn, if you'd like to have anything else said. My recollection is and I think I sent a memo on this. The problem with the resolution is it's overbroad which, insofar which as- Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Which resolution? Do you mean the first one in June? The first one for income maintenance. Okay. Okay. It's overbroad insofar as we have voted cer that certain types of administrative proceedings like workers' compensation should be out. So- yeah, I agree. The only one that I recall left to decide is should unemployment benefits be in or out of the program. And I recall Carolyn was opposed to it because of the potential impact that could have on a wrongful termination case down the road. But as far as I'm concerned, if we modify the language in the resolution, then we just need to deal with unemployment at the next meeting and just come to a resolution on it and be done. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, and Carolyn, did you wanna go back to anything that, um, or do you have a sense of whether you want EDD to be discussed separately as we have done with income maintenance and um, enforcement of judgments? Yeah, I think Steve is right. I voted no because of those implications, which again are some of why I abstained before um, to see the, um, the, this was specifically what came to mind was evidentiary. You know, are these now going to be um, attorney, attorney client privilege, evidentiary issues, the impact of these? Um, so I, I think that needs to be fleshed out. I do also notice that it does say non attorneys in here. And I don't, we were getting really particular with claimants and parties. Um, I, I think that in if I voted no, it was probably um, I would keep that vote. And I don't know um, if I wasn't in, then I wasn't in. I wasn't at it. I wasn't at it. <laughs> I don't know how I go back on this. The non attorney the non attorneys are not the same as claimants. If you might remember, um, and some of this happened before you joined, but I'm pretty sure you were at 
because there was a big memo that you part of, you wrote in and dissented to. The non-attorneys are already authorized to represent claimants yeah. as parties do, but claimants in administrative proceedings. So we were saying if they're already doing it, we shouldn't say that they shouldn't. So that's why we're, we're seeing non-attorneys in, in that resolution. Oh, so it's broader than paraprofessionals because they already, you're they're already, already doing it. Right, right. Um, and, and going forward, we'll, we'll, they do represent parties too. So that language is probably okay. Is, um, the, is the sentence, the specific details of allowed activity, is that where we shift over to regulation and licensing? No, the specific details of allowed activity is, will be discussed later, is the things you want to carved out, which was um, wage and hour and EDD. Okay. okay, so we've already, okay. Yeah, so Brady. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that um, on the resolution where it was non-attorneys non are authorized, that, that we are allowing paraprofessionals to practice before administrative tribunals where non-attorneys already are allowed. Yeah. That it was also clarifying that, that that permission extended not just to the actual act of sitting there, but that advising them outside and before the proceedings was also permissible, clarifying that that's not the unauthorized practice of law. Whatever right. they're doing now is, yeah, it yeah. Was, we were willing to just leave it as that. And recognizing some of it was, I mean, we talked about federal jurisdiction and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, thanks Brady. So for me, I think we should just leave EDD and not talk about it and leave it in the pocket as a, put it back as a non carve out basically, wherever, that's what I think. But um, is that helpful, Leah? Is yeah, so what, so what you're, what you're the, the practical impact of what you're saying is we don't need to have a meeting, another meeting. Basically, it's time to write the memo. And to clarify, I think you're right, Steve, this resolution and just trying to go back and read memos and then look at what was actually voted on. It's, it, 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 you know, sometimes it's sloppy. So um, I think we could clean up the language around the admin agency proceedings and what exactly is excluded from the authorization, like workers comp and a whole host of other things, the federal benefits proceeding. Um, but we wouldn't need to have another meeting or hear from any for their subject matter experts. That's the impact of what you're saying, Judge you. And that's basically what I was asking. Yeah. And I don't know if it's sloppy or as much as just these were a lot of compromised decisions that did not get made all at the same time. And so things were decided later, like to exclude workers' comp, for example, that was not really reflected in language in June. But Steve has his hand up and then Ira. Steve? I made my point. Oh, sorry, your hand was up though. Anything else? Okay, Ira, and we have 10 um, minutes left, seven minutes left, Ira. All right, uh, two things. Uh, first, um, <laughs> what are we talking about here with, to, about doing with these resolutions? We're talking about rephrasing them, staff rephrasing them or something like that. I don't understand that. Okay. So Secondly, do you want me to say that number two? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, I'm not sure where, if where uh, unemployment, EDD uh, lands, if we maintain uh, resolution number one, uh, is, it, is it authorized? Are paraprofessionals authorized to represent in the unemployment hearings or no? Um, so we're not going to go back and change the wording of any resolutions. However, when we write the memo, we can um, merge the thoughts so they don't seem so disconnected or contradictory. And then with respect to EDD, that was initially carved out along with wage and hour to respect Carolyn's concerns and those of the people that she's, you know, talking to and representing. But now um, uh, the question is, do we, do we need to go through all the processing we did for wage and hour with EDD? Or can we just say EDD is back in the initial resolution that paraprofessionals are authorized to provide full scope representation at the administrative level um, where non-lawyers are already authorized to practice or to represent basically. So that basically whatever's going on with EDD, paraprofessionals can do. That's a question that we're right. asking or what? Right, that's the question. Is that is that what you think would be all right? Or do you wanna hear oh. from experts 
and have us process it like we did with wage and hour and have a separate type discussion. I'm all right with uh, including the EDD representation. So we wouldn't have to- Without meet. further uh, ado. <laughs> okay, Steve, I wasn't sure where you were. Can you just, uh, in like, we have five minutes. Well, where are you? Do you want more meeting on that or are you okay with where yeah. we are? I, I give my proxy on that to Carolyn. She was very concerned about it. Because she was concerned, I wanted it out of the program. If she has that concern, if that concern, if including EDD in the program causes her concern, then we need to hear it out and have a vote on it. If it doesn't cause her concern, then I'm okay with it. Okay, but we can't vote by proxy, I learned, when I had to count. I, 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 I understand. Okay, Carolyn? I don't think we need to hear, and this one, I don't think we need to hear any additional experts. Um, and maybe we do, again, my problem is not with the concept. My problem is, is again, with the, with the, how it turns out at the end. This one is probably, there's a need for people to be helped and they're being helped. But again, if you, there's so many evidentiary issues that need to be made sure we're, we're catching on the regulatory end. A lot of these things, I just don't know why we're reaching so far with our pilot project, you know, when we're, you know, we've spent 30 years, 20 years trying to do this and you'd think you'd keep it simple to get it through and see how it works. So- I'm so, oh, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. No, no, I mean, I don't, we're running out of time. Um, I, don't, I don't think we need any extra, you know, my problems are not with the process of EDD, which I am more familiar with just from life. Um, it, it's the impact of that on litigation that's very severe. And so the language is what it is. If I voted for this or abstained from this or wasn't involved in a committee, I don't think I'm allowed, I don't think I can go back. But when we get these final reports that come to pass, we get them three, four, five days in advance. And what I'd like to have happen is for Leah to put together a package of all the resolutions, you know, in one PDF and circulate it to all the members. We have new members. Um, of the committee. So this is what it is. And um, no, I don't think we need a whole further uh, discussion of it and we can continue to adopt it. But okay. I really would like to see, I don't think it's gonna be that hard for staff to go through and pick out the, the 15 things that we've already decided. I think we have to have those. I think, going since, forward. sorry to cut you off, we have two minutes. So I, what I'm hearing is that we're all okay not having any more meetings, that EDD will be you know, under the June resolution. And I'm glad that we won't have an April 5th meeting because it does give staff more time to write the report and then we can get it earlier um, and process it together um, by email, okay? Yeah, I, I just may, might put a little clarification in the bottom with regard to what administrative agency impacts are. Um, just a couple paragraphs because legislative interpretation is uh, needs to be in the in the notes. We go we go and we look in the notes for the, um, you know. So at least some some of us go to look at the notes for interpretation. Of the okay, we have sixty seconds left, Carolyn. So when we go circulate the report, I'm I hope that you will put in whatever you need to put in about defining what an administrative proceeding is. Okay. So let me just go back to Leah and then Justice Petro to see if there's anything else we need to cover because it's 1259. No, but thank you for really excellent facilitation. <laughs> I don't know about made that. It, made it happen today. All right. And thanks to everyone. And I will uh, get a draft of the memo out. Carolyn, we've also heard your request. I think it's fair. Um, we will be pulling that together and... Um, and thanks for your hard work. I'm glad we're not meeting because you just, it's one less meeting giving you a whole day to do something that all the things, all the balls that you're keeping in the air. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Happy spring. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you soon. I okay. won't be here on Friday because I've got court, but um, take care, everybody. Have a good rest of the week. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.